Okay, so let's start talking about prions. Um, just really quickly, let me go through prions. It's, it's something that's very rare, um, but it's just important to, to know uh, that they're out there. Um, prions are referred to as infectious proteins. Um, of course, of course, it's only a protein, uh, and the prion protein is actually something in our brain, and it's thought the, the its function is thought to have something to do with shutting down signals, so neurotransmitters um, to have it has a, a a function in the shutdown of them, um, and so when you alter those, of course, then that's going to cause um, problems in the brain. But not only that. Um, Accumulation of anything that is dysfunctional in your cells leads to dysfunction of that cell. So when your prion proteins convert to the diseased version of prion proteins, they will just simply accumulate in your um, brain tissue and cause your neurons basically to lose function over time. So prions are proteins that have been, uh, that cause um, the bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cattle. Um, also known as mad cow disease. Um, it was initially identified in sheep. It causes um, scrapies in sheep, and so that's where the prion protein gets its identity. So you have the um, prion uh, SC for this um, uh, scrapies in sheep. Your prions in humans can lead to a fatal disease in the central nervous system. Um, and we'll talk about some of the human diseases in just a moment. A few notes about the infectious proteins is they're only about 5 to 100 nanometers. Uh, they are not nucleic acids, they're actually a folded three-dimensional protein. They are re resistant to many forms of, um, and of um, I'm blanking on the word, but basically you can't irradiate them, alcohol, um, boiling, etc. You can put it into a autoclave um, and you can destroy these in autoclaves. Um, so it, it can be inactivated in an autoclave, this one right here. They are going to what they call replicate. I don't like that term because it's just a protein, but what they've been shown to do is they'll actually, your inside of your DNA, you have the program to make the normal prion protein. And if you have, if you get infected with the scapes version because you ate um, either sheep or cattle that were infected, for example, those prion proteins will cause your normal prion proteins to convert to the diseased form. So they will replicate in that way by using your normal prion proteins and converting them to the diseased prion proteins. And they don't really initiate inflammatory response either. So the actual disease is not very well understood. Similar outcomes, you're going to have a loss of neurons. Again, you have an accumulation of these prion proteins, um, disease forms, and they're going to lead to dysfunction in, in your um, nervous system. Um, and so the cells are going to die. You have proliferation of astrocytes in your cells, and those are similar to like your macrophages uh, in, your, um, in your central nervous system. It's called spongiform because you see vacuoles in the brain and it happens throughout the cortex and the cerebellum of the brain typically. The incubation pe period is months to years, so you could have eaten bad meat and then a year later died from uh, the actual disease. The infection is always fatal, so this is key. So there is no treatment for this infection. There is no reverting the prion um, disease protein back to the normal protein, for example. So it always will lead to a fatal infection. Um, so the prion protein is shown here. This is the normal. It's the prion protein, um, and it's, been, it's called C. And the prion protein that's bad is that scapes, scrapes SC version. And you can see that the proteins have these coils. These are alpha helixes. Um, and so alpha helixes are important for spanning membranes and things like that because they have a lot of hydrophobic regions. Whereas your scapes, you can see that these helixes are changed with these beta sheets, which are shown here. So the conformation is completely different. And if you change the conformation of the protein, obviously it's not going to function as it normally would function. So important to note that we do have a normal prion protein, 
It's, it's coded by our DNA. You ingest the scapes version of the prion protein, and that's going to convert all of your normal to the SC version. And this is going to be what causes the prion protein scapes to multiply by just simply changing your normal prion protein that your body is normally making. Pathology is um, vacuoles. So this is um, a person infected or who has died from um, prion. And usually this is going to be post-mortem, of course. So this is a prion infected brain as compared to a normal brain. And you can just see that the tissue has, is just vacant. So it leaves these holes, these vacuoles. There are some human prion diseases. There was a form of Kuru. This was in, um, discovered in um, the 50s in a, an indigenous population of New Guinea. And what, these, what they found, what investigators found in this particular area was that um, women and children often would die from this unknown um, infection. Uh, and one of the practices of the people were that if the elders passed away, um, the women and children would eat the brains of the elders because they would be passing on their information to the women and children. Um, and however, in this particular population, a lot of the uh, people were infected with these prion proteins. And so by the women and children eating them, they in turn would get the disease and would die from the disease. And so they discovered this and they asked the population to stop doing this practice and the disease disappeared from the population. There is also a fatal familial insomnia associated with prion proteins um, in which you get um, the initial symptoms are you have a difficulty in sleeping and then you progress to more neurologic defects such as dementia and then unfortunately um, it is fatal. There is creutzfeldt jacob disease. Um, this is all, also uh, fatal disease and it's going to lead to um, similar neurologic symptoms. You're going to have progression about four to six months. You're going to lead to paralysis, etc., and then eventually death. Mad cow disease, of course, was when um, the cattle in um, England were infected with the, um, the, the scapy form of prion protein and then it got passed to people who ate um, from the cows that were affected. Um, if you do get diagnosed with a prion disease, you're, you typically only have a couple years to live at that point. And again, a lot of people don't know they have it, um, and then it would be diagnosed post-mortem. It is very rare. It's a scary disease, but it is not a very common disease. Do you guys have any questions about the prions? Or prions, however you want to say it. Did you say it can only be diagnosed post-mortem? So how would they know that they only have a couple years left to live? Right, so it, it can be diagnosed, but you'd have to have some something that would give you uh, a person um, know that you were exposed to it. So somebody who, for example, is a, a sheep farmer and several of their sheep died from um, scapies, and then all of a sudden they start presenting with neurologic um, problems. And so something like that, it wouldn't be like someone in Manhattan who has now dementia, you wouldn't think prion is the cause of that, for example. Quick question on that. I just had a friend die from prion disease. And what I heard from a friend, not directly from her husband, is that it was spontaneous. Is that possible that your normal um, prion can change? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert in prion. Uh, so I would, in my opinion, um, with a diagnosis such as that, it might mean that they don't know what caused it. Um, so yeah, she, she was a veterinarian, so I assumed that she had come in contact with something. But anyway, um, so I, yeah. I was skeptical on that spontaneous diagnosis as well. Maybe yeah. that was just to make the family feel better. Who knows? Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, there's some research linking prions with Alzheimer's. I was wondering if you had any information on that. Um, I don't have information on that. Um, Alzheimer's is a um, chronic disease, typically. 
Um, so death oftentimes is um, years after it's been diagnosed. Um, and it's very progressive in that, well, it, and you also have very big, um, you have highs and lows. So you'll have a region where you, you lose some sort of cognitive ability and then you'll plateau and you'll be maintained at that plateau for a period of time. And then you'll lose more cognitive um, capabilities and then you'll plateau again. Um, so, but prion is pretty um, progressive, meaning that you, when you start getting those neurologic defects, you just simply just go downhill really relatively quickly. Um, so I, I don't know whether or not it's a, I mean, a lot of things are being tested for with respect to Alzheimer's, um, but I, I don't know if prions are going to be um, a major connection with that disease. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our last part of this is uh, our COVID-19. So COVID-19, of course, is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual virus. And the it's caused by a coronavirus. Um, so that's where the CO comes from, and the V is for virus. Um, and the 19, of course, is when um, it first came about uh, in 2019, the fall, winter of 2019. So let's talk a little bit about our virus so the virus itself mary i'm so sorry to interrupt yes. the um looking at the study guide is i don't see a section for this um coronavirus is it something um that will be a bit extra but important to know or would you like us to formulate some study guide questions um i, I might add a few to your study guide uh, not too much okay. not too much at all thanks mm -hmm. so coronavirus hey. another question Oh, is this PowerPoint published? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard find, time finding it in modules. It should be in the module section. Mm, I can check that actually. I think. No, I don't have it open. Uh, oh, wait. Let's see here. I think it was under midterm two lectures. Right, I'm pretty sure it was too. I think everybody else found it, it was just me. Okay, um, I'm moving the module to the top. Okay, the module should be at the top now that has it. Okay, so SARS-CoV-2 again is um, referred to as a beta coronavirus. Um, so it basically has that um, spike protein that everybody now knows about and its receptor is the ACE2. There is more involved with respect to how this virus enters, but it does enter by budding um, through fusing with our cell membrane and then releasing its RNA and its proteins into our cells. Um, you have the another protein is called a hemagglutinin ester dimer. Um, you have membrane proteins, envelope proteins, etc. So it's it's a typical envelope virus, um, and it is an RNA virus. Now, just as a little bit of a background, we do have other coronaviruses that have um, popped up that have been highly infectious uh, and high have high mortality. We have coronavirus that circulate and they cause a common cold. A few human strains do that. Um, but these strains have been more in, uh, lethal than the normal um, cold-causing coronaviruses. So I did not include those co cold-causing coronaviruses in, on this table. So the first one that popped up was SARS, and some people call it now SARS-1 because now we have the SARS-CoV-2. And SARS-1 came about in 2003. Uh, you can see here we had about 8,000 cases primarily um, in China, and the the fatality rate was 11%. Now, if you look at fatality versus transmissibility, you can see as the fatality decreases, which what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2, the transmissibility increases. So if a virus kills its host too quickly, it's not going to be able to transmit very well. MERS was Middle Eastern um, respiratory, um, severe respiratory syndrome. So that was another coronavirus that came out in the Middle East. And we, there still are some cases of MERS in the Middle East that come up year to year, so it's still out there. 
SARS, we haven't seen a SARS-1 case for well over a decade now. So MERS came about in 2011, and it had fewer cases than SARS-1, and part of that is because of the high mortality rate, about a 34% mortality rate with MERS. And then now, of course, we have SARS-CoV-2. And in this case, we have a very low mortality rate, high transmissibility rate, and the question is now, when are we going to see the next SARS um, come about? Is this going to be something that we're going to have to now start monitoring? It's going to be hard to monitor because there are a lot of coronaviruses out there in population, animal populations, mammals. Um, and so, it, but again, it might be something that the, our public health community might have to um, start to monitor. Um, so how does so coronaviruses spread to so fast? Um, so they, this is just an, a, a diagram from a paper that was done from 250 patients that are presenting for delivery and within this population you had a majority of them that were negative 84 percent were negative you had your symptomatic positive which is 1.9 percent and then you had your asymptomatic um, positives which were 13.5 percent uh, so SARS of course is a respiratory virus so it, it we all know it it's going to be spread by respiratory droplets as well as aerosols like all respiratory viruses are. Um, how far the respiratory, um, uh, how far the virus can actually travel in there um, is under debate, but if it's similar to like the cold, um, or not so cold, sorry, measles and influenza, it can, it can travel a decent, um, um, it, it's no different. So our sneezes to cold or to flu to measles to SARS is the same. So it's, it's going to have the same sort of distance. Now, as I told you before, measles is the most contagious. Um, and so it can, if you have 100 people in the room, 98% of them are going to get infected if you have a measles case, whereas flu, um, you'll have 80%, etc. So even though they are, um, we're expelling the virus similarly in our aerosols and in our droplets, the actual spread is, is different from virus to virus, and it probably has to do with the minimum infectious dose um, and things, of, uh, things like that. So how does it get in? We know it has an ACE receptor, so it has to bind to the ACE2 receptor. Um, we also know that it needs a, a accessory host protein, which is um, this Timpress 2. Uh, the Timpress 2 is actually what's going, the virus is going to borrow this enzyme. It's a protein, it's an enzyme to cleave its um, spike so that it can actually um, invade our cells. Um, it is a systemic infection. So one thing to keep in mind with viruses is that typically the route that they take to get in isn't necessarily where they're going to end up. And we know this with our hepatitis viruses, they get in um, in various ways. Uh, hep A gets in through your gut, finds its way to your liver, etc. So the viruses get in and then they can disseminate. Um, so the ACE receptors are also going to be found on these tissues. So we have it in our respiratory tract, of course, but we also have some in our gut. Um, in our endothelial cells that line our blood vessels have um, ACE2 receptors. Our heart, that should be heart, sorry, and our central nervous system. So a lot of people were concerned that this virus spread fecal oral because um, people had um, digestive diseases. So um, diarrhea is a, a potential symptom. But that's not the case. It's getting to your gut through dissemination. Um, the virus is enveloped and your stomach acids would rip the envelope to pieces and the virus would not be able to infect your gut that, in that way. So it's getting out, it's getting into your circulation, and then it's spreading to other organs. So our immune response to SARS, of course, is it's a virus. It's an obligate intracellular parasite. And so we want to have our T cells. So T cells is what you need in order to um, eliminate this virus. There's a lot of talk about antibodies. Um, antibodies are very easy to measure. So usually that is a measurement of immunity. And often the um, ability or the function of your antibodies does correlate with T cell function because as you guys know, in order to get those really good antibodies, you have to have T cell help. In order to get T cell help, the T cells have to be activated. And if you're activating CD4 cells, then the likelihood is also you're activating CD8 cells. 
We typically don't measure in a clinic your CD8 response because it's very difficult to measure. There are assays to do that, and we use those when we're doing uh, research, but it's they're typically not um, a very quick turnaround, very robust assays that can be very cookie cutter and um, happy and be used in a clinical setting. So antibodies, ELISAs, are typically the um, what is measured, and that and so that's why there's such a um, a a focus on antibody responses. But for the intracellular pathogen, you have to have the T cell response to clear the viruses, the virus infected cell. Okay, so what happens in some patients? So again, um, caution to reading um, news articles and things about coronavirus. Really, if you hear something, try to get to the source of where they're getting their information from because news articles love to pick out information. And unfortunately, scientists, we, we're, we're often very vague um, in our writing because if we don't know the actual result, we are not willing to say what it potentially could be, for example. So just a word of warning about reading and taking information from news. Um, so some patients, there has been reports that they have seen biopsies of lymph nodes and they have a lack of germinal centers. Um, and these patients typically are going to have low antibodies, so it's not clear why this is happening. Also, we've heard about cytokine storm and shock is happening in some patients. And again, this is an acute infection, so uh, most people are going to get infected. They're going to clear the infection, but your immune system is going to keep going. And that can cause um, inflammation problems. In addition, this, because it's a respiratory infection, what we know from other respiratory infections is they wipe out those ciliated cells that help prevent your bacteria from colonizing your lower respiratory tract. And as you guys know, your normal flora, bacteria, your staphs and your streps, they can cause shock. They have those um, antigens, super antigens, and they can lead to cytokine storms and shock. And so when you start moving in your bacteria, you start getting pneumonia, you start getting the potential for shock. Um, so we don't have to go through these basic definitions for you guys, but just you guys know an infection means you get invasion of the body by the infectious agent. In this case, it's SARS. Inflammation is your body responding to the actual infection. Um, and so it's going to release those cytokines that we talked about. It's also going to activate your B cells, T cells, etc. So this is an image of a lung. So you have a normal lung, and then of course you have a lung with pneumonia. Um, and so this is an image taken from a patient. Um, and so it is very serious. And as we're learning more about the coronaviruses, we're getting better at treating these other symptoms. And so hopefully our case uh, fatality rates will continue to decline. So case fatality rates in the U.S. by age. Um, so this is from the Centers for Disease um, CDC. And so you can see that you have a higher percentage of individuals dying as their age increases. Um, and very few are, patients are dying in the 20 to 44 range, for example, and even fewer um, that are in the younger um, children. Um, so again, we know that our susceptible population are our aging population, and so a lot of our controls and our community controls are geared towards protecting those populations. Um, so this is detection. So you hear a lot about should we use PCR, should we use antibodies, and again, it's going to bend on the time, and you know that antibodies take time to develop. Um, in these these um, days, all the way up to day 16, um, the antibodies are going to be primarily IgM. Um, IgM is very hard to detect by ELISAs in a clinical setting especially. There's, um, there's more testing available with IgG, for example. And so you're going to see um, antibodies used more on convalescent materials than on uh, actual acute materials. Uh, the viral RNA by RT-PCR can be detected uh, very early, and so that's why it's being used as the primary to determine if somebody is infected or not. 
Uh, drug treatment, so there's been a lot of talk about different drugs. Remdesivir has been in the news. That's a nucleotide analog. I'll talk about that. Um, notice I, it has a nucleotide and not a nucleoside, and I'll mention why that is. We, did, we talked about um, the virus um, nucleic acid analogs, and I know somebody had a question for clarification, so hopefully going through remdesivir will um, reinforce what I previously talked about. Remdesivir was originally designed for Ebola, so that was when a few years back we had that, that Ebola um, outbreak, and so um, um, Gilead uh, was developing remdesivir. And so remdesivir has also been shown um, to treat hepatitis C, um, and it's recently been approved for um, use in SARS-CoV-2 patients. We also have treatments that'll target the cytokine storm. So you have the anti-inflammatory, um, cyclosporin is an anti-inflammatory. So those are, the, those are what those drugs are being used for. They're not targeting the virus. Okay, so remdesivir is shown here. So again, we have a um, nucleotide shown here. And this is our normal nucleotide. Um, so I'll just go over this really quickly. This is your sugar. So this is your, in this case, we have an OH. So this is ribose. And then our nucleotide is over here. So this is our um, purine nucleotide, and it's attached at that one carbon position. This is two, three, four, and five carbon positions. I can actually load this up. Okay. And so on that three carbon, so your three carbon and your five carbon is where you will have your phosphates. So you would also eventually have a phosphate here, and that is going to make up your backbone, your sugar backbone of your DNA molecule, is you're going to link, or this is RNA, sorry, your sugar backbone of your RNA molecule. You're going to link to a phosphate, to another ribose, to another phosphate, to another ribose, etc. And then at your one position is where you have your actual nucleotide. Oops, I didn't want to, sorry. Um, you'll have your actual nucleotide at the one position. So this is where you will add your adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, um, in this case for RNA, uracil, etc. And so those bases. Okay, so what we are trying to do with a nucleoside analog is you're trying to take this ribose, go back to the yellow, you're trying to take this ribose and change it so that it is going to be incorporated into the virus genome, but it's not going to allow the virus genome to continue its replication. So it's going to be sort of a suicide inhibitor of the virus uh, replication system. And so you can see remdesivir looks very different than our, um, our normal ribose. One of the, some of the things that I'll go through in each of the slides is we're going to talk about are these different um, numbered regions. So in this case, um, our one got taken off. This is our one. Um, so in this case, remdesivir is referred to as what they call a non-obligate chain terminator. And this is because most of those nucleotide analogs I talked about before are missing this OH group. Remdesivir has it. So on that third prime or that third carbon, that OH would often be, uh, be uh, removed because it wouldn't allow another phosphate to bind and so you can terminate the elongation. But remdesivir doesn't do that. Remdesivir actually does have an OH there. So a phosphate can come in and bind to it. So remdesivir at position two, um, shown here, is basically it's uh, pairing to a uracil molecule. So um, adenosine, of course, would bind to uracil in the molecule, um, and this would allow the bases to link together. Um, remdesivir looks very similar to that um, uracil binding, and so it's thought that this similarity is what tricks the virus into actually incorporating this molecule into its structure. Um, what's 
important is that our proteins also use uracil. And so the, the chemists had to make sure that um, this would not be incorporated into the host proteins, but only into the viral proteins. Okay, let's skip that part. Um, and then so position C, or three, is a... Mary? Bomb. Yes. I have a question. If you go back up to that slide, mm -hmm. so you were saying that Rindesimir is a nucleotide. So um, I guess it's one more, one more slide up. Oh, this one? Yeah, so right there it says use of nucleoside to develop. So you use a nucleoside even though it's a nucleotide analog? Right. So the nucleotide versus nucleoside has to do with the phosphates. Okay. So that's all that that's referring to is as you start adding phosphates, you go from a nucleoside to a nucleotide. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we're here on three. Okay, so the chemist at um, Gilead also wanted to um, bring in some stability, and so that's what this bond here is at position three. And you can see that that bond um, is very different. This whole area is very different in our normal um, uracil than it is for um, your remdesivir. So this is the, that just makes it more stable. Now what the key is, is this four position over here. You can see that we have no cyano group in our ribose. It, um, it doesn't exist. And so what happened with the Gilead group is when they developed remdesivir and they actually um, tested it in, in mouse studies, it was very toxic to the mice. And so basically it, it's actually just a matter of trial and error. The chemists just kept adding groups to this molecule to see what would work. And they found that by adding a cyano group to this number one carbon, um, in addition to the, um, the uracil analog, they were able to reduce the toxicity in the animals. And so that cyano group basically is preventing the host, which is our cells, from incorporating remdesivir into the host proteins, but it still tricks because of the virus has no proofreading, so it still tricks the virus into incorporating this into their growing um, uh, uh, RNA molecule. So because we have proofreading, we can we and we have mechanisms to prevent uh, this cyano group. Um, the side effects go away from the for this drug. And also, they have this five prime phosphate of group, of course. Um, one thing that is unique about this remdesivir is again, it has uh, this, this phosphate group. Most of our nucleoside analogs do not. So this has the phosphate, so it's referred to as a nucleotide analog. Um, and the phosphate is a, it allows it to get into the cells much easier. Um, so that's one of the, issue, the, the issues with the phosphate. The second is that it's going to um, resemble that normal nucleotide which um, which then, again, would be tricking the virus. So that's how remdesivir works. It works similar to those other nucleoside analogs I talked about before in that it's just trying to trick the virus into putting these analogs into their genome so that they it's a, a suicide and it's a dead end for the viruses. Now, really quickly... Oh, Okay. Sorry, I was, uh, is it okay if you do just like a quick summary of, um, so you have like uh, position three, the nucleoside bond is for stability, position four is to help reduce toxicity, right? Yes. Uh, the, so basically, uh, <laughs> right, okay. So, yeah, keep going. <laughs> so four reduces toxicity, um, but maintains efficacy. So our cells don't incorporate it, but viruses still will. Um, we have the two, which looks like uh, uracil. So the virus, so it tricks the virus. But because of the cyano group on four, uh, our cells might be tricked as well, but that's not, well, it was, that's why it was so toxic. Um, but adding that cyano group, our, 
our um, machinery won't incorporate this. Um, the position three is for stability. Uh, position five is for absorption. Um, and for it resembling, so again, it's going to trick the virus into looking like a true nucleotide that it wants to incorporate into um, the growing chain. Did I get them all? Um, oh, and then one. One's limited here. This OH is, um, is basically functional. So in theory, a, another um, ribose should be able to bind to that OH group. But what's preventing that is going to be the um, actual um, mismatch of the what is looks like a uracil to an adenosine, for example. So um, it's, it's pretty clever how they put it together. Some of it is a little bit of luck, especially with that cyano group. Um, but again, the nice thing about this also, I should point out, it's able to work against hepatitis, has some efficacy against Ebola, and whether or not it turns out to have um, a lot of e efficacy against SARS, um, CoV-2 remains to be seen. Those other nucleoside analogs, remember that I talked about, were very virus specific. It had to be a herpes virus or it had to be HIV because they needed to use the virus's own enzymes to activate them. Remdesivir doesn't need that. And partially the reason why it doesn't need that is because it has this um, OH group and it has this phosphate group. And so it's already coming in sort of activated, so it doesn't need to be activated. So that makes it more a little bit more universal than those other nucleoside analogs. Okay, any other questions about remdesivir? Okay, so quickly about the human trials of our in our pipeline. Um, so we have various vaccines at various stages. Uh, I think I took this a few weeks ago, so it might need to be updated. But pretty much none have been approved yet. There's some talk about having some um, approval for limited cases. Um, what I think we're going to see is we're going to see that the vaccines are going to be approved for high risk areas such as hospitals, maybe nursing homes. That's a bit up there, but definitely hospitals and uh, first responders to try to create these micro herd immunity uh, environments. And so where people are going to go who are infected, such as the hospital, the people helping those patients will not bring the virus out of the hospital and, and back into the communities, for example. Uh, the vaccine approaches are going to be genetic vaccines. So uh, Modera is a genetic vaccine. There is, uh, the government put a lot of money into Modera. And one of the reasons they did this is because the messenger RNA vaccine that Modera is coming up with already went through a phase three trial for influenza. And so their phase three trial for influenza using the same approach ended in March of this year. And so they quickly just changed their, um, their, the makeup of their messenger RNA to target SARS. And so that's why the government put a lot of money into that company because they, they have already taken a vaccine of messenger RNA through phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And so um, keep an eye on that one. AstraZeneca has um, inactivated viral vectors. Um, there's a few inactivated viral vectors. Caution with these vectors is that they've been tried in the past over and over again for different viruses, and we haven't yet had one um, be um, licensed for human use. Typically, adenoviruses are used as the viral vectors. Adenoviruses have tropism for um, many cells in the body, and so th they're using the adenovirus to deliver the virus genome into cells, for example. Um, so those are in the pipeline as well. We have our typical protein vaccines. Those are spike proteins. Um, they're going to be given with uh, different adjuvants. The problem with that is you have to not only get approval for the spike protein, but also for the adjuvant. There's only one adjuvant approved for human use, and that is something called um, serum albumin. <laughs> Hopefully you guys understand serum albumin is in our serum. Um, and so it typically keeps um, protein, it protects the, the half-life of proteins. And so that's the only adjuvant that is currently available. I do believe, I don't remember the adjuvant they're using, but I know 
it's not um, it's not um, albumin. They're trying to use something that will trigger a toll-like receptor response. Uh, there are inactivated SARS viruses. Uh, Synovovax is making that. Live attenuated, as I said, is more outside of um, this country, so that's being developed in um, China and India primarily. Okay, just as a pipeline. Um, so I think regardless of, you know, politics and all that stuff, one of the things that is remarkable is the amount of um, collaboration we're seeing with respect to industry, academics, and government in trying to push a vaccine through the pipeline. So this is just an outline of one such pipeline. Um, Dan Baruch is a um, colleague of, uh, of mine. I've, I, I, I went through um, a postdoc in the same lab that he had done previously. Um, and so I'm aware of him. He's a great researcher, um, primarily HIV. But of course, when this all came out, um, people shifted a lot. So basically, um, January 10th, the virus sequence was released. This was released by uh, Chinese researchers. Um, January 13th, three days later, the group um, uh, under Dan Baruch ordered genes um, and they started to design the vaccines. And they're using an adenovirus approach, so that same sort of uh, vectored approach I just talked about. Um, and January 31st, they, they formed a collaboration with Johnson & Johnson. February 6th, they started testing their vaccine in actual animals. Um, February 24th is when they made what's called the virus challenge stock. So basically the viruses became available, so they grew them out so they can test um, their vaccine using actual live virus. In March, they started testing in different animals, mice, ferrets, monkeys. Um, on the 30th, the manufacturing of the vaccine for Johnson and Johnson and Johnson actually began. And then they started their first human trials in September. So this timeline right here takes usually five to seven years. This timeline from here to here takes another five to seven years. So going from making a vaccine to actually getting it into the population is a minimum of about 10 years. And so you can see that this timeline is months. And so I think that is something that should be commended. Now, whether or not it's going to turn out to be um, have great efficacy uh, still doesn't uh, diminish the fact that the timeline and the pipeline has been accelerated. Now, of course, going from here to here, um, safety is gonna be an issue. So um, I don't think we're going to compromise safety for e efficacy, um, but again, it, it's um, it's pretty pretty fast pace. So these are some key vaccine questions that you have to consider when you're developing these vaccines. Of course, you're interested in protection. Now, these early vaccines are probably not going to be the most potent. Let me talked about those live attenuated vaccines, and so there's going to be a compromise of it's not going to prevent people from getting the virus. It might not even prevent some of those early symptoms, but hopefully it's going to prevent the later symptoms, the pneumonias and things. So you're going to get prevention, uh, protection from those diseases. Again, how many doses? A single dose, multiple doses. Um, will there be enough new infections to show that it protects? So this is an interesting point, and there's a group in England that is trying to get approval to do live virus testing on vaccine approaches. This hasn't yet been approved ethically, but they are starting to recruit people who are interested in being part of the study. They're gonna have a group of people of about 90, they propose to test different doses of the virus to see which dose of the virus is actually infectious. So these are people who are gonna be given actual coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 into their uh, to the respiratory tract. And then they're gonna have another group of people and they're going to, their idea is to vaccinate them with different vaccines and then do a challenge um, with the actual virus. Now, human trials such as that have been done in the past. However, they've only been done on pathogens that we have um, treatments for. So they have never been approved on a pathogen that we don't have a clear treatment of. So whether or not they get approval for that, um, who knows. But on the other side, 
if you're going to give a vaccine to a population, try to show efficacy. There has to be enough circulating virus in order for people to get exposed. So that's one of the things, or how are we going to show that a vaccine actually protects? And then there's going to be, is the vaccine going to be available? Can we make enough? Right now we can't make enough to make herd immunity for flu. So, um, and we've been doing that for years. So can we make enough of the vaccine? And I think, you know, we've all heard about the government's warp speed or whatever they call their, I think it is called warp speed. Warp speed is not for pushing a virus out unsafely. What warp speed's um, goal is, is to put the money into um, uh, companies like Johnson & Johnson and Modera so that they can actually start producing the vaccine before we know it actually works. So just in case it does work, they have a stockpile of the vaccine that can actually be um, used immediately. Um, how about age? So one of the problems with vaccine trials typically is that we always test them in healthy um, adults around 18 to 40 years old. We know that we need to protect our aging population. Um, so are they going to be included into vaccine trials? We'll just have to wait to see. Uh, does the vaccine require cold chain? What that means is our live attenuated vaccines, our gold standard, has to be properly um, kept chilled. And so one of the problems with vaccines in developing countries is they don't have the resources to keep the vaccines cold. So um, in the 90s, for example, they were having outbreaks of measles and they were say, claiming that these were taking place in uh, vaccinated populations in Africa. But when the CDC actually went down there and tested their vaccine stocks, they were all non-viable because they hadn't been kept chilled. And so that even though they were administering the vaccine, it had no potency. So they were basically just giving the people um, an injection for no reason. Um, how durable is the immunity? So that's a big question, of course. Is it going to last? You have to vaccinate every year. Um, do vaccine antibodies enhance infection or cause this? It was interesting, the CDC in um, February put out a call for, um, for people to do investigations on this novel virus. And um, one of the questions they had was to test whether antibodies enhance infection. This comes from dengue virus. Um, so it's always in the back of everyone's mind when you have multiple strains of a particular virus. And now we're seeing SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV-2. Um, are the antibodies helpful or are they going to facilitate the actual infection? One way they can facilitate the infection is that um, your macrophages have receptors to bind to your immunoglobulins, those FC receptors, and macrophages are found throughout the body. They can move things around. So can a macrophage in the lung pick up coronavirus, move out of the lung and spread the infection, for example? And then there's also that multifocal inflammatory syndrome in children. This is again another type of shock, overreact it's thought to be an overreaction um, to the actual infection. And so will the vaccine protect against that? Okay, so just the last slide. Um, so again, we have, it's almost as if the, the virology community and the vaccinology community were building up to something like this because we have tried all of the approaches that everyone's trying now for other diseases. And so everything's getting a little bit better. Our understanding of these vectors are getting better. Our understanding of how to deliver nucleic acids is getting better. And so these advances are accelerating our responses to this actual uh, pandemic. Even though people are you know, a little bit weary, they think everything's going slow, it's going at rocket speed according to science and discovery, in my opinion. Um, some things to consider are SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, is, it seems like you can get transmission before symptoms. We also have our asymptomatic super spreaders, they call them. Um, and so you don't have to, you don't even know you're infected and you're spreading the virus. Uh, the infection results in, of course, that hyperinflammatory state. And so when, um, if you, even if you look at influenza and deaths associated with influenza, they're usually linked to a pneumonia. And that is, again, our bacteria moving in and causing those um, side effects. Uh, currently, we have no highly effective treatments. Doctors are trying many different approaches. Um, and oftentimes, they feel like they're feeling in the dark in some ways. Uh, we do have prevention, so mass, physical distancing, hygiene. So this whole um, pandemic sort of bringing together three critical things that we know to help prevent infections. There's sanitation, so that's number one. 
oops, sorry, I wanted to put number one. Um, we have our drugs and antibiotics to um, help with secondary infections. And our three, we know the value of a vaccine. So sanitation was approximately in the 19, um, hundreds to 1920, that's when you started having public health and sanitation that really helped control bacteria infection. Antibiotics, I believe, was in the 30s, maybe 40s, something like that. Vaccine was about the 50s. And so these approaches have been around for a long period of time. And so with this coronavirus pandemic, I see, I think we're reinforcing how important they are for infectious diseases. Okay, any questions? Okay, great. Um, so do you guys need another break?